So, what do the next three years look like in policies to tackle climate change? I long ago gave up having any confidence in my predictions about what would ne happen next in the world generally, um, and especially on Australian climate policy. I think the safest heuristic is imagine the stupidest, most short-sighted, most ecologically suicidal thing that could happen, double it, and you're getting relatively close to what will happen, uh, certainly at the federal level. But again, the picture in the States is always uh, more more convoluted, more complex. So in, in, South, in South Australia, you have a Liberal government that is implementing some of the energy transition policies of the previous Labour government and maybe the energy transition uh, towards renewables and energy storage is unstoppable. Uh, in New South Wales and Queensland, I think we're just going to see more extraction, um, especially I think the Adani mine is quite likely to go ahead now, uh, which will be just more kerosene on the, on the fire. Uh, I don't see how a Liberal government, a Liberal national government, will feel uh, compelled to seriously work towards meeting Australia's uh, Paris Agreement obligations. And whenever we talk about the Paris Agreement, we should also mention that even if that were fully implemented, which it's not going to be, we are committing the world to uh, somewhere between two and three degrees of global warming. Uh, if everything works out as we would hope it would, and it won't. So the idea that Paris is sort of, if we met Paris, we'd be okay, no. And frankly, we're not going to meet Paris. Um, so do I see a party proposing a transformative policy to tackle climate change and survive an election? No, no, I don't. And what it would take is the same as it would take here in Manchester. It would take a time machine you need to go back 20 years and you need social movements, uh, churches, trade unions, uh, environment groups, tenants and residents associations, you name it, to actually get their game face on, to understand that this is or was an existential crisis, and to, in the uh, language of uh, Extinction Rebellion, move the Overton window, um, making it impossible for politicians to do what they've done uh, for the last 30 years, which is make bland promises, uh, which removes the heat from them, and then they go away and don't bother to even meet those bland promises. They allow the bureaucrats to kill off in the committees any genuinely uh, useful ideas and then make excuses and more bland promises with more glossy booklets and leaflets. There is such a thing as too late. I think it's now too late. Uh, I don't see the Western democracies responding to climate change in anything like the way that they could have or should have. Um, I think what we'll now see is desperation, geoengineering, uh, attacks on uh, the right to protest, which we're already seeing in New South Wales and other places. I think we will see some really horrendous uh, human rights abuses over the coming decades and forget about abuses to all the other species on this planet, that's going to go off the scale. I mean, that already is. We're in the middle of the sixth grade extinction. Uh, it's bleak, and it's not going to get less bleak. And I've been consistent in this view for a very long time, since the early 90s. And fun fact, uh, oversharing, but here we go. I had a vasectomy in 2004 uh, because I didn't think that it was responsible to bring a child into this world. And people said, oh, are you worried about what uh, your child will do to the planet? And I said, no, not at all. I'm much more worried about the, what the planet will do to my child. Um, final, final formulation. The second half of the 21st century is going to make the first half of the 20th century look like a golden age of peace, love and understanding. I hope this helps.